This episode of Pop Health Week is brought to you by Health Innovation Media. Health Innovation Media brings your brand narrative alive both on the ground and in the virtual space for major trade show, conference, and innovation summits via our signature pop-up studio. Connect with us at www.popupstudio.productions. Hello, everyone. I'm Greg Masters, Managing Director of Health Innovation Media and the producer and co-host of Pop Health Week. Joining me in the virtual studio is my colleague, co-founder, and principal co-host at Pop Health Week, Fred Goldstein, President of Accountable Health, LLC. Our guest today is Sharon Danks, the founder and executive director of Green Schoolyards America, a national nonprofit based in Berkeley, California. Green Schoolyards America's mission is to inspire and enable communities to enrich their school grounds and use them to improve children's well-being, learning, and play while contributing to the ecological health and resilience of their cities. Since 1999, Sharon's professional work and passion have focused on transforming school grounds into vibrant public spaces that reflect and enhance local ecology, engage the community, and nurture children as they learn and play. Her work is now focused on scaling up the green schoolyard movement and integrating school ground design, management, and use with green urban infrastructure. An accomplished schoolyard designer, researcher, and speaker, Sharon has traveled the world to study hundreds of school grounds and share best practices. She is the author of Asphalt to Ecosystems, Design Ideas for Schoolyard Transformation, and co-founder of the International School Grounds Alliance and Bay Tree Design. Sharon has served on California's statewide environmental literacy task force and was honored to become an Ashoka Fellow in 2017. She holds master's degrees in landscape architecture and city planning from UC Berkeley and a bachelor's degree from Princeton University. And with that introduction, Fred, over to you. Help us get to know Sharon's work at Green Schoolyards America. Thanks so much, Greg and Sharon. Welcome to Pop Health Week. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, it's really a pleasure to get you on. Uh, I've gotten to know you a little while over the last couple of months as we've worked together on some of the fantastic work you and your group are doing. So why don't we start with giving uh, our audience a little sense of your background? Sure. Um, uh, I am the executive director of a nonprofit organization called Green Schoolyards America. Um, I'm an environmental city planner by training. And this year we've been working on the, the National COVID-19 Outdoor Learning Initiative. But in normal times, uh, Green Schoolyards America collaborates with school districts to help them transform their asphalt-covered grounds into more park-like green spaces um, that we are using to improve children's well-being and their learning and play variety while also contributing to the ecological health and resilience of our cities. And we're working on on systems change overall and trying to change the standard way that school grounds are designed, managed, and used so that all children uh, will have access to the natural world and the places that they already visit every day. So in essence, this group uh, takes a look at your schoolyards or recommends doing doing things to enhance it, put trees in, gardens, things like that. Is that really where it goes? Yeah, that I did that type of work. I've been, I've been in the green schoolyard field over 20 years, and that was a part of the work that I, I used to do when I had a design firm. Um, but what Green Schoolyards America does now is we work with district staff um, at citywide. On, we work on citywide and statewide projects to help public agencies and school districts think about think as land managers and think about what they want from the hundreds of acres that they manage. And we help them set up long-term programs um, that are systemic, that look at shifting hundreds of acres from pavement into ecosystems. Oh, fantastic. So as we think about this, COVID shows up and now we've got this whole issue with schools. How did you get involved with that? And who are some of the other members of the group that got involved with that? Sure. Um, well, in, in we've been working a long time with school districts so we could see that, that there was a need coming when everyone had shut down and um, last spring and it was just uh, it was it was so it was so comp- such a complicated time. And so we were brainstorming with school district partners about how we could help them. And they said, you know, we really need to go outside. And so we, we put together started putting together some plans that would help them do that. And I uh, gathered a, an initial coalition um, to create to create an initiative. And uh, so Green Schoolyards America partnered with the Lawrence Hall of Science, uh, the San Mateo County Office of Education, and a nonprofit organization called Ten Strands. 
and we um, together held a, a kickoff session on June 4th, a webinar where we proposed that schools around the country could use their grounds uh, for outdoor learning um, as a way to address the, uh, a way to reopen during the pandemic while reducing transmission risk. Um, and we based this on the idea that we had seen in uh, old photos from 100 years ago where um, kids all over the world and their classes went outside during the tuberculosis and Spanish flu pandemics. And, and so all they did was pick up their chairs from inside and go outside. And we, we said, you know, we don't need to overthink it. We can do the same thing. We have um, all this land and it gives us space to spread out. So, so the webinar was a kickoff. We had an initial document that was spread around and the outpouring of interest was amazing. Um, so the next step was sort of to pull these various groups together and uh, I know ultimately there were hundreds of people involved. So how did that happen? So our initial idea, when we saw we had a thousand people who signed up for the webinar um, and uh, many more who asked questions afterward, we thought we would create a simple, a fairly simple how-to guide on our website um, to, to make it so that school districts didn't have to reinvent the wheel to be able to do it. They could use some materials that others had put together. And so we, we created about 10 working groups um, and, uh, and we're thrilled to have you participating in our health guidance group. Thank you so much for your, your contributions there. Um, we, we, so we gathered people from, from many different sectors into different areas that um, could focus these how-to materials on, on the areas that they knew best. Um, and we asked everyone to write what, what they thought that schools would need to, to use to be able to go outside. Um, and this modest original modest project turned into a, a gigantic undertaking and we've produced a library instead of a how-to guide uh, which I'm really excited about and I think it has a lot of great resources that we've been hearing from school districts have been very helpful in helping them get outside. Yeah I thought it was fantastic I mean the first group I got involved with was I got on this call from these people who were all experts in landscape architecture and making these outdoor spaces really cool and fun and interactive and safe and I was just kind of blown away. I think there may have been 70 people in that one group on the call I was on. And I, I quickly realized that that group was not quite where my expertise lay. And so I said, okay, I'm going to do get involved somehow and, and got involved with the health group. So who were these different committees and, and what did they work on? What were some of the key areas? Because obviously that's a pretty big endeavor to say we're going to move ourselves outside and conduct classrooms outside. Yeah, and um... – it does take it takes a whole range of professions to help um, work on the material. So we hit, we had the the an equity working group that was focused on helping us to think about everybody at all of the schools and find ways to keep um, to center equity as a, one of the central things that we were working on and making sure that all of our materials and to address this idea of creating a, an, a how to manual, we uh, brought committees together um, in all different areas. And um, I'll just step through them for you. One of them was the, the equity working group, and their job was to, to write an equity mission statement for our project that, that underlies the entire initiative. Our goal was to, to help schools equitably reopen um, and using outdoor spaces as a way to do that. And so they, they helped us to, to hone the focus of our overall initiative, and then also to check in with all the other groups and documents that were being produced to make sure that we were following through on our goals of, of coming up with equitable solutions. Um, second group was the outdoor infrastructure working group. And I think that's the one that you joined uh, at the beginning. And it was, we had um, an amazing um, energetic and, and um, wonderful group of experts in landscape architecture who helped us to create all kinds of tools uh, and guidance documents relating to how do you pick seating and shelter and think about the weather and make cost estimates and site plans and, and even an augmented reality tool for projecting a virtual classroom into an existing uh, photograph of a site so that you could explain, you could build consensus at a school using a picture. So we have all kinds of tools on that outdoor infrastructure page produced by that group. We had a separate group um, working on outdoor infrastructure uh, at parks, uh, assuming that not every school has space on their own schoolyard. And so some would need to be walking um, out of their own gates and into local parks and into streets that were closed. And so that group produced documents that are about the logistics of how you do that with the school community and how do you write an MOU with a different outside organization to get them to let you do that. And 
um, what do you need to bring with you for emergencies and that type of thing. So that that group, the parks, we called it the parks working group, but it's really about moving learning offsite in general. Um, and then we had another group that was focused on the educational curriculum side and staffing and instructional side of, of this. Um, so what were you going to teach when you get outside and how are you going to teach it and what's the logistics of the schedules and um, they're, they're probably, I'd say the, the school districts that are trying this fall into a couple different categories. Those who have tried, who have existing outdoor learning programs that are just looking to scale it up and they're, they might be teaching from the landscape as part of their curriculum too. And others who are trying it for the first time who are just trying to move outside and simply use the outdoor spaces to teach the same way they do inside. And so that group thought about those different needs and we're trying to provide materials for both. We had another group uh, that was focused on integrating school programs, whether those were lunch, um, having lunch outside when everyone would have their masks off, um, and library time and art time and music time and other types of activities that are not traditional classroom-based programs that group worked on. Um, we have a, had a community engagement group that also thought about strategies for bringing in the wider community at each school and helping people participate. And then the health guidance working group um, that, that you collaborated in um, and gave your expertise to, we really greatly appreciate that. Um, and that, that group focused on both the, the, um, the COVID science, helping schools understand all of the different types of things that the various health authorities were telling them, sometimes with conflicting information. And so that group was sorting through it and helping to present it in a way that that would be easier for school districts to understand and navigate. Um, and then there, there's also a section of the webpage that was produced that's about the, the benefits of health benefits of nature and why we might want to do this for the long term. We also had a group had a group that was focused on sorting through state, local, and national policy models and, and also funding resources and were uh, trying to communicate the what was happening at the national level with CARES Act funding and others that, that schools should know about so they could apply for it and helping districts understand which pieces of that they could use for to fund their outdoor learning models. And, um, and then we also, that group gathered um, examples of good policies that were health authorities had included outdoor learning in their explicit directions. And we wanted to surface those and make them available for others to use and think about incorporating into their own work. Um, and then lastly, we had a, um, a group, the 11th working group it was a community of practice for early adopters. And it met, I think it's met 24 times so far since June, the end of June. Um, it met weekly over the summer and every other week in the fall and, and this year. And it's a community of practice for schools and districts that want to move learning outside during the pandemic. And now we're also talking about and beyond. Um, and so it's a, a, a place where district colleagues could talk with one another and present their updates to one another to say what they're working on and, and get some help in working through common issues um, and be inspired by each other. And, and so we have, it's an ongoing working group every Tuesday at 11 o'clock, 11 a.m. Pacific. And we have links on our website for anyone who'd like to join. And we're, we've been recording recent presentations and those will be on our website shortly so people can see what individual districts have been doing. It's really, really exciting. It's Wonderful to see how all the materials that, that all these working groups have been producing have been helping schools get outside. Yeah, it's amazing how much work went into this. And once I got into it, suddenly started thinking through all of the different areas you talked about. We kind of framed this thing as a base on equity. So you start thinking about equity to get people outside and individuals who may have difficulty walking or other things or may have allergies. So all of those things were being considered as we did it or equity in areas that maybe don't have much space. You know, what do you do with that? So amazing. One of the things you mentioned, which I thought was just fascinating when I first saw it, because obviously those shiny objects are sometimes cool, even though there's tons and tons of resources on your website, was the app that people could use. And could you explain a little bit more about what that thing does? Because I was just really impressed with it. Yeah, um, there, we have an augmented reality app made by a volunteer. His name is Sean Coriel. And he he took a site plan that we had created to explain to schools how much space an outdoor classroom would take up with kids sitting six feet apart. We have a diagrams of little spots on the ground in circle. And he took that those diagrams in scale and put them into an augmented reality app that he created that allows any user to take a an iPhone running Safari and to point it at an area of their school ground where you can see a 
the image that you're about to take a picture of and project into that image um, a three-dimensional model of an outdoor classroom space and then take a picture so that you can it's it's I like to think of it as Pokemon Go meets schoolyard design it's like you know it's this virtual things that don't exist like a virtual tent and virtual seat log seats um, projected into the landscape that you can photograph and then show others in your school community so they can see what's in your head about what should be going into each spot in the schoolyard. It's a consensus building tool that makes it real and, and makes it site specific. Um, and it's really, really cool that he made it yeah. for us. And as I recall it, you could do round seating, you could do different seating types, and it would lay it out within that photo and you could see where to place each of those items so you could safely put a a class there. It was really exactly. fantastic. One of the other issues in, uh, you know, that came up a bunch, and I still hear it as I'm trying to push this idea out to get people to consider moving their classrooms outside, is weather. And everybody's complaining about the weather. How are we supposed to do this? But it, as I learned and was just stunned to find out, and you obviously knew, they were doing this stuff in Maine, right? Yes. Um, <clears throat> it's funny that there we... There are schools all over the country that are that are doing this work, and the ones that seem to be the farthest ahead as as like a, a region of the country are the ones that are the coldest, which which those of us in warm places um, uh, find really interesting. Um, so you know, I think that that there's Maine, for example, is a, a leader in going outside. There's a number of school districts in Maine that have been outside since September for a good portion of their classes. Um, Portland Public Schools has probably the largest program with 156 outdoor classrooms that serve about 5,000 kids on a rotating basis. Um, and, and so I think that, that um, the equity issues we were talking about come up when we talk about weather. And, and so we, we recommend that schools consider weather appropriate clothing, part of the infrastructure of an outdoor classroom so that all children are equally warm and dry as the seasons shift. Um, some of the other weather adaptations that we see are that when weather is cooler, or even cold and snowy, um, kids don't need to sit in their classroom. And it's actually kind of hard to sit on a cold day in the same spot. It's better to get up and move around. So one strategy to keep warm is to keep moving, which helps increase physical activity uh, as well. And so um, a lot of the kids in the cold climates are doing hands-on learning. They're going on hikes through snowy forests, and they're, they're um, doing art projects that involve constructing things outside, or they're doing science lessons or other things that are that involve movement as well as, as academic studies. And um, they're also having their meals outside or other things that, that don't, um, that where they can, they can sit in one place for a little while, get up and explore and, and um, do a variety of things. But we also, we find in other places that have a lot of rain, that shelter is a really important piece of planning for weather. And so many places are doing that with tents um, and rain boots and rain jackets. <laughs> combined, I think, just so that you're not feeling cold and wet. Um, and uh, yeah, I think hot drinks also are, are good on a cold day to to keep people warmed from the inside. Um, we have some school districts that have made scarves and mittens for kids and given those out or foot warmers. And, um, but in warm places, we also need to think, particularly as spring and summer come through, if there's outdoor learning all summer to help catch up on learning loss, Shelter and shade, I think, are particularly important in keeping kids well hydrated and having enough sunblock. Um, things like this become the weather adaptations for the warmer places. And if you're just tuning in, you're listening to Pop Health Week. Our guest is Sharon Danks, founder and executive director of Green School Yards America. And I know as you talked about this, particularly with the schools that, that are, are looking to do this, you actually had groups of volunteers who will help take a look at what the school's property looks like and sort of lay out ideas or places they could do this? Yes. Uh, so so the um, cre there's a, a page on our website called Creating Outdoor Spaces, and that page has on it many tools that are meant to be self-explanatory for school districts and schools to go through and, and do some site planning on their own. And if they do it on their own, it's things like taking that app, the augmented reality app, and taking photographs and then going to Google Earth and taking an aerial photo of your schoolyard and putting locations on it. And that's one way of communicating about your site. But for schools who are new at this and might want a thought partner, we do have um, a wonderful program called the Emergency Schoolyard Design Volunteers that was founded by my colleague, Claire Lottenay. 
uh, who's a professor of landscape architecture. And she has brought together about 250 landscape architects and other designers from all across the country who have volunteered to be the thought partners in um, making site diagrams with schools. They're, they would help a school think about what they already have that would work as good out, outdoor learning spaces and what they might want to add to that to to extend the shade or to extend the seating or but thinking strategically with a partner and so that's what um, the emergency school year design volunteers are doing and we have signups on our website both for designers who'd like to join that effort and for schools that would like help and i guess i've had you mention your website a number of times where should they go to find the stuff um it is on uh the website is green schoolyards plural.org um, and the tab is under COVID-19. Uh, and so you can, all the information is there. And um, we're, we're calling the, the, the National uh, COVID-19 Outdoor Learning Initiative has a, a site on that COVID-19 tab. And, and it's become, um, the name we've given that webpage is now the National Outdoor Learning Library. And so it, it currently is filled with uh, materials focused on COVID-19. And, but we're, we are, uh, increasingly also extending it to be a long-term resource. And so we're encouraging schools to, to invest in things now that they can, will meet their needs to address the pandemic, but that they will also be able to keep in the years to come. Um, a picnic table you buy now will be useful for many years, for example. And, you know, how do you, how do you inc- keep this going? And so there'll be more and more resources appearing that are about long-term benefits and uses and strategies. So one of the ideas around this is that it goes beyond COVID, that we continue with outdoor education for children and K through 12. And I know that there was a committee or a group of this, a big work group that looked at all the benefits associated with outdoor learning for children. Yes, uh, the, there are many different kinds of benefits that were looked at in from different perspectives and in different contexts. And and um, I mean, this, this work is... Uh, 30 years old in the United States. I've been working on it for 20. So, and the reasons that we were doing it all predate COVID, right? So, so from the health perspective, um, there are benefits for social, emotional wellness, for cognitive benefits, for physiological benefits, uh, mental health benefits, and benefits for vision and for sleep. Um, and a lot of those are tied to the presence of nature and trees. Um, and so the website explores some of those in detail and has a, a a fantastic list of the studies that have shown those things. Um, there are also ecological benefits for long-term uh, outdoor learning for converting pavement into ecosystem-based parks. And those are about climate resilience and stormwater management and wildlife habitat uh, production. But on the climate front, it also crosses into health uh, because we we have in- weather that's going to be increasingly erratic and warmer and children who are generally not shaded at all at school. And so we've been tracking that long before COVID of, and trying to, trying to channel some of the funding in out there across the country in for climate mitigation to get it to be um, spent in part on school in, in schoolyards. So children can directly benefit and be protected from, from heat. And so we, we look at, yeah, the, the value of shade to reduce temperatures specifically on school grounds and protect kids from um, UV as well. Yeah, and I know the whole issue of, you know, some schools have huge pieces of property and they've got grass and trees and things like that. And others are inner city. And, you know, I recall growing up in New York City for a while, the school yards were small. But even those schools found ways to do thing out, do things outdoors. What were some of the ideas they used? Um, for smaller school grounds, they I, I have been to some schools in New York that have had their edible gardens um, in hanging planters on perimeter fences. Um, and um, I think you don't need uh, a large planting even to, to bring butterflies and birds to your site. You just need the right plants in the right place. And um, calm, like in, in New York City gardens, I've seen um, mental health oriented gardens that were quiet seating areas for kids to who needed a, a break from the hustle bustle of the day. Um, and those are also can be small spaces for small groups to gather. Um, trees, uh, a single tree with a big expansive canopy doesn't take up much ground space, but has a, a nice shady um, umbrella. And I think we also see schools with smaller campuses um, developing programs to take the kids out into the nearby neighborhood to make use of local parks 
uh, and to set up joint use agreements with parks so that they can they can do that as well, extending their own footprint. Um, some have gardens on the roof. Yeah, like I seem to recall when I'm doing classes on the roof, another one maybe in the street and things like that as well to expand their spaces. Yeah, the New York City, um, the New York City Education Department actually per, uh, early on in this fall in the fall invited schools across the city in New York City to go outside and and I think it was something like 700 schools that that said yes to their offer in the first 48 hours or something. So there is great interest in New York in getting outside, which is amazing. Um, and so I think you can do it um, clearly spreading out for for um, in the context of of the pandemic, spreading out needs space. Um, but uh, and so some of those schools are they, they in New York, they also gave some schools permission to close the streets near them during the day so that they could have space to to have more um, room to spread. Yeah, I really think that's fantastic because we know what the impacts we're now seeing, how serious the impacts are on these children who weren't able to get into the classroom, socialize with their friends and neighbors, et cetera, and obviously sit there at a Zoom screen or whatever the educational system is they were using for technology. And it's been really devastating, as we see from the mental health perspective. So I know that recently the CDC, you mentioned this before, came out with a, a at least a one-line recommendation that outdoor schools is a, a potentially more safe way to go, which is some good work. Where do you see this going in the future? Um, in in what way? In do you see schools continuing on with this after COVID, or is it or? Definitely, um, I I think we from the schools that have. We've heard a variety of really encouraging reports from the schools and districts that are trying this. Um, for the ones that were outside in previous years, um, we talked to one school that had 30% of its program outside in previous years and was 95% outside this year and said, we love it and we're not planning to go back to the 30. We're going to stay closer to where we are. Like We just love what we've built and we're, we're staying here. Um, and I think that many of the school districts we're talking to are also trying to build on the momentum that that has been gathering now. Um, They're seeing fewer behavioral problems, kids, because kids are more engaged. They're liking what they're doing. They're happier. They're not um, having discipline issues. Um, And they're, they're, so they're trying to figure out how to, how to keep that. And we are working on trying to support them in, in doing that. And I think that there are, there's some policies that need to be aligned. There's staff positions in districts that would need to be funded to, to have coordinators of these things and to have, have the infrastructure follow through, um, you know, in a, in a long-term way. But, but the interest is really exciting. We're seeing it from state agencies. Um, the state education department in Wisconsin wrote a version of our website that they tailored it specifically for Wisconsin. We see Maine moving in that direction, I think. Um, and there are a lot of, of county offices of education that are also encouraging it. Um, well, that's fan- and- I mean, it's really fantastic, you know, to get all these groups involved. And I wish we had some more time, Sharon, because I'd love to get into this even more. And I, But I know that if people go to your site, you're doing webinars and a lot of people are joining it. So really, it's a pleasure to have you on. And sorry we had to kind of cut this a bit short. But thanks so much for joining us, Sharon. Thanks so much for having me today and for all your work on this initiative over the last year. We really appreciate it. Oh, it's really been my pleasure. You folks have done a fantastic job. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Greg. And that is the last word on today's broadcast. I want to thank Sharon Danks, founder and executive director of Green Schoolyards America, for her time and insights today. Do follow her work on Twitter at S Danks. Yes, and on the web at www.greenschoolyards.org. And finally, if you're enjoying our work at Pop Health Week, please like the show on the podcast platform of your choice and do consider subscribing to keep up with new episodes as they become available. For Pop Health Week, my colleague Fred Goldstein and Health Innovation Media, this is Greg Masters saying bye now. Bye now.